Yamadamurang, Nadu Yindyamara Gadigal Nurumbam. Welcome, and I pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. A new year revives an old debate. How does Australia settle its unfinished business? Tonight, you will hear the cases for and against an Indigenous voice to Parliament. Joining our panel, Assistant Minister for Indigenous Australians and Yanua Gara woman, <laughs> Malandiri McCarthy. <laughs> Leader of the National Party in the Senate, Bridget McKenzie. Senior Australian of the Year, Tom Kalmer, who helped lead the voice co-design process. Gunai Gunditsmara and Jab Warang, Greens Senator for Victoria, Lydia Thorpe. And New South Wales Australian of the Year and Chair of the Republican Movement, Craig Foster. What do you need to know before you vote? Thank you for that. Welcome. It's great to be back. Now, remember, you can live stream us around the country on iView and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag. Let's get started tonight with Peter Heffernan. Thank you. Uh, a wise man once said, never vote for anything that you don't understand. I don't understand the voice legislation. Why should I vote for it? Tom Kalmer. All oh, right. There's no legislation as yet. Um, there's just a, a discussion paper that's out there. And um, if you had the opportunity to have a read of the co-design report, you would see that uh, there's a lot of detail in there about what the structure may be. And also the government has established a referendum working group and a referendum engagement group. And um, we, we've said this since last November, that this month and, uh, well, and this month's over, but uh, into the next month, we'll be getting information out and you'll see a significant campaign from Indigenous Voices working with government uh, towards the end of February. Bridget McKenzie, the Nationals have already said no, mm. uh, even though, as Tom said, there's more information and more detail still to come. Why do you say no before that information? Well, Stan, we have been asking for that information for a long time. Uh, it hasn't been forthcoming. We are the political party that represents electorates that have high proportion of Indigenous community. So we set up an internal process within our party last year, um, post-election, led by Jacinta Nampajimpa Price, but including other uh, backbench MPs. I mean, you look at the seat of Parks, Mark Colton, up in Western New South Wales, 16% of his electorate are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. When you compare that to electorates in places like Goldstein or Kooyong, you've got less than a thousand voters who actually identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders. So we went out into our communities, asked them uh, whether they thought the voice would actually make a difference for them and the aspirations they have for their families. And the overwhelming feedback we got back from our local MPs who had done that and fed it through our internal process was that it wouldn't. And so for that reason, for the fact that we don't think it will address the issues we see and confront as local MPs and the voice of regional Australia it in our communities, um, we are voting no. It's fair to say, though, isn't it? I mean, the West Australian Nationals have had a different position on this. Mm. Some in your own party room have had a different position on this. There is not a unified position from the Nationals either. Well, the Nationals' federal parliamentary team is very united on the fact that we don't support a voice. We have been asking for more detail. That hasn't been forthcoming. Um, we have a senator in Senator Nampajimpa Price who has the lived experience coming from the Territory, a Territory, as you do, Malandiri, 30% uh, of that whole Territory is Indigenous and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. <coughs> she has come brought to our party room and to the Parliament, like the other 11 uh, Indigenous Australians who are now in our Parliament, uh, the voice of the vulnerable from the NT. So when I speak to, say, uh, commun Indigenous communities in my home state of Victoria, it's a very different experience for them than vulnerable communities in the NT, in remote WA and Queensland. And, Tom, we've spoken about that. Yeah, and, and I think what's important to remember is that during the co-design process, uh, we went across... Uh, we had 130 meetings 
plus about 65 of them were across remote Australia. And every one of those consultations are recorded in the co-design consultation report. And you'll see that there was almost universal support for for the voice and what's being proposed. So I think as a conservative, one of the most important tenets of that philosophy is localism, where I really support the right. local and regional voices yes. that Tom and uh, Marsha's report goes to, their very first chapter. It's a key recommendation of that report that says before you talk about a national voice, local communities, local people, have to find local okay. solutions I, I, because they're going yeah. to be different for every community. Yep. I want to bring some other voice. Peter, can I just go back to you? From your question, is that to suggest that you don't understand it as yet? Is that what you're saying? Uh, pretty much, yeah. I, I, my concern is that I, I need to be a, a constitutional lawyer in <laughs> order to, to, to grasp basic legislation. Mm. And I, I, un yeah, I yeah. take the point that it hasn't been drafted yet. I, I, I want to put that to Malandiri. Malandiri, um, we know we're going to go to a referendum. The question has been framed. When you're hearing this already, does that raise concerns with you? Not at all, Stan, and thank you, Peter, for the question. Uh, firstly, if I could just pick up on Bridget's point about detail, uh, let's remember that the Coalition Government had the report go to the Cabinet of the Scott Morrison Government twice. The former Indigenous Affairs Minister, Ken White, made that very clear uh, in, the, in recent months. Uh, that the coalition did have the detail and it had been taken to their cabinet. So we have to be really clear here that there's a lot of things being said that perhaps need to also be questioned. So coming back to you, Peter, this is our opportunity now as the Australian Parliament to reach out to all Australians, to be able to answer those questions to the best of our ability. Uh, at the end of this month, we are going to see the uh, voice uh, yes campaign kick off uh, with the working group and the engagement group going out across the country. And this is the time now between February through to the end of the year when we want to reach all Australians. Lydia, can I come to you on this? Is, is, you've raised concerns around this. Are they based on what Peter's talking about in terms of a lack of detail or people not understanding it? Or are there other issues as well that you're bringing to your, mm. your questions that you're raising around it? Absolutely. There are a number of issues. Uh, I think the detail is what uh, the Prime Minister outlined at the Gama Festival, and that is a, an advisory body that will advise the Parliament uh, on, on things that affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But we have to remember it's an advisory body. It has no power. Uh, it has parliamentary supremacy over it at all times. The parliament will decide who gets on the advisory uh, and the, advise the parliament will decide what they do. So there's no real power in a voice, or in a, an advisory body to the parliament when we are one of the only Commonwealth countries in the world that does not have a treaty with its first people. And Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been marching the streets for a treaty for as long as I've been alive. Uh, so treaty is, is, has is, been is, the... that, is that the point, Lydia, that treaty first? Is that... We have to maintain that our sovereign status is protected and not affected by anything that goes into the Australian Constitution. We have to remember the Australian Constitution is only a couple of hundred years old. And it came over uh, and, and wanted to override the oldest constitution on the planet, which is ours. So to conform to the laws of the colonial power is destroying our country. We've seen the, dev the devastation and destruction over the last 200 years that colonisation's done, not only to our country, but to our people. And so the demands, what we want to see first, what grassroots blackfellas want to see, the ones you saw on Invasion Day, who didn't just rock up because they felt like it, they do it day in, day out. Uh, their, their concern is sovereignty as First Nations people and... We want to go down the treaty path. We're sick of tinkering around the edges. Um, We've been advisors mm. for too long. We just, want better. Yeah. Just on that question of treaty, we are going to come to the question of treaty specifically a little bit later. We're asking you to vote in an online poll tonight as well now on this topic, our Facebook and Twitter accounts. The question is, do you know enough about how an Indigenous voice to Parliament will work to vote? 
in a referendum. It goes very much to what you're talking about, Peter. Let us know and we'll bring you those results later. Let's move along now. Our next question is from Philip Gerber. Yeah, before I, I preface it by saying a, a Yungul Manji grandmother once said to me, um, it, we know the intervention was needed, but you could have asked us how you should do it. My question as a voter is, will the government's proposal for the National Voice consist of 24 people appointed by regional and local voices and not an elected group, and they'll have an eight-year term limit, and I understand that was what was recommended in the Calma Langdon report, so this is really directed at the government. Uh, is that the proposal that you're putting up, and will the 24 voice members be full-time and salaried? So, Thanks. To the Minister. Thanks. Thanks, Philip, for your question. What we have now at the moment, and you're right, that comes through with the Calma Langton report. Uh, what we have now is the working group, and uh, Professor Marcia Langton and Tom Calma are two of the people on that working group, and there is the reference uh, referendum engagement group, and all of those people on that group are there to advise us as to where we go. Now, in the coming months, we will be able to have a better response as to what we want to do. But firstly, the question is really about whether Australians want to enable First Nations people to have involvement in policies that impact and affect them. And I think we have to be very clear that that's what we're asking uh, through the question that the Prime Minister put uh, to Gama, at Gama on Yolngu country, uh, as a draft question to all Australians. So, yes, what uh, uh, Tom Kalman and Professor Langton in their report uh, has made available to us, we are still working through with all of that, but they will mm. be considerable points for us in the long run. Can got I a just follow add up. to yeah, that, yeah, sure. that um, the Labor government have already picked their advisory body who is advising That's them right. now, uh, and the other groups that they've set up, they've all been hand-picked. Our communities haven't had a say. But and that's, that's not, the that's issue not here. It's our not people, unusual. Our people need to have a say on the grassroots level and rather pitch. than the top down all the time. But it's not that's unusual. It's not unusual. I so mean, what uh, we... state and territory governments have that. No, 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 it's, it's perfectly normal. Uh, for state and territory governments to have advisory groups, uh, whether it's First Nations people, whether it's to do with the economy, whether it's to do with sporting bodies, uh, this is what happens when you want to govern. But the question here is that if we did not work with First Nations people in developing a voice, then we would be attacked for not working with First Nations people full stop. Can, can, can I just say, as up. someone that was... Your, your question is... A really good question because you've obviously looked at the detail of Tom and Marsha's report and it is about local and regional voices feeding up into a national voice over time once that's bedded down. Our Cabinet put $38 million to start that process in the last budget, uh, Assistant Minister. Your government cut that in your October budget so that work that had started out of Tom and Marsha's report was already starting to be undertaken. So and you've jumped the straight... details. So you've had the details. No, no, I said, said I so, agree. So, so, so you've had I've the details. I agree. 38 I million. Agree. And you know. So, so you walk away saying you don't have enough details. No, Very interesting. No, no Malandiri. I'm sorry, <laughs> Senator. I did say I agreed with local and regional voices. I was very upfront with that. That was the first thing I said. We put money behind that. That is very different to want, asking the question I want, of what I want it comes to people. Craig, you've been sitting there very patient, my friend. <laughs> you are? Um, yeah, what, I mean, can, I'm, can, I'm enjoying can, this. Can, can, can I, I mean, you're listening to this and, of course, we'll come to your yeah. issue a little bit later with the Republic and that's something else down the line, but at a base level, a first principles level, how do you approach this? Um, this is one of the most important questions, uh, one of the most transformative moments in... Uh, modern Australian history, post-colonial history, and the big question is what we have to answer. And what I think we're hearing here are the concerns in the community that have to be addressed. Mm -hmm. However, we have to keep bringing it back to the main question is whether we want to finally take this step to listen to the voices of uh, First Australians. And we've never done so uh, prior. This is an historic event. This is actually, I would say, it's it's more than once in a lifetime, it's once in many lifetime event for us to have an opportunity to listen. So uh, listening to all of the mm. 
and, uh, and different points of view. Yeah, different first points of view. That's right. As well. Exactly. Mm. And so mm. we need to break down all of the uh, all of the different viewpoints. Mm. That's fine. But from a perspective as a non-Indigenous Australian, my, our responsibility is to listen uh, to also a process that has the cultural authority. Uh, and whereby the Uluru Statement, I think, had 250 leaders out at Uluru. And so, for, yeah, we're in a position where we, we I think, uh, not that I speak on behalf of other people, but from my own perspective, we're in a position where we're now saying, and the country of Australia is now saying, we're listening and we want to listen to you. We want to bring this to life. There are issues over sequencing. However, this is really about um, embedding the rights yeah. To be listened to a First Nation people in our constitution, so which your, in many your respects immediate response is out. The principle of this is to say yes to the voice, and we have to keep coming back. That, that, to this. That's your now. Just, to say just yeah. on that, it's not cultural yeah, yeah. authority. <laughs> <laughs> what the people who rocked up at Yalara, not Uluru, because mm -hmm. remember the Uluru family said no to even using the word in the beginning, but the people that rocked up were the ones that were picked by the referendum council. Mm -hmm. They were funded. They were from organisations and corporations who already have a mandate uh, in controlling our affairs in our communities. So the problem at that meeting, whilst they say there was consensus, what do you call 20 people walking out of a meeting? Do you call that consensus? Or do you call that something that you'd probably need to address oh, yeah. before you well, continue down the I'll, path? I'll give Tom a chance to respond to that. Uh, only that I, I wasn't at Uluru and wasn't part of the dialogues, but my understanding is that it was... Uh, after they had the dialogues, it was a community who identified who would be the delegates that went to Uluru and or to Yalara. Um, and, and they, they made community. a... Well, if the community wants to pick an organisation, so be it. But it was led by the community. Um, there were other groups that no, weren't invited and um, mm. or, or weren't nominated by their communities who also turned up. And, you know, there's... That's OK. That's, that's part of a democ democratic process. Mm. But, um, yeah, we can't say that it was the government or anybody else picked these people. The community nominated who they wanted. And, the and poor yeah, black yeah. fellas <coughs> could not get all the way to Yalara. Can you imagine our communities who are struggling to survive each day, getting on a plane and going to the middle of yeah. the country and staying in a flash hotel? That was mainly organisations and corporations and we've been saying it since that day. That's why the people walked yeah. out, because it was already a done deal with the people behind the scenes. But and that's a frustration our people have. That's, you know, we, we've but there wasn't on. a frustration no. for the Anangu people and it wasn't a frustration for over 100 of the Aboriginal languages of the Northern Territory. Yes. If there was one time where we felt enormously proud of hosting First Nations people from across the country, it was that time. Where the salt water yeah. met the desert country, where the Yolngu came to Anangu country, that was where we felt incredibly proud to host it. It is an imperfect world. It was cultural. We will never, yeah. ever, as people, as humanity, get things perfect. But it is so important that we try and we never give yeah. up trying. Mm -hmm. our, next, um, our next question comes from Richard McGuire. Richard? Richard. Richard McGuire. Richard. Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yes, my question is for Lydia Thorpe. What practical <coughs> provisions would you put into any treaty and the processes before and following them that would ensure that a treaty does not disadvantage Indigenous people and will protect their sovereignty? And how long do you think it would take to get this result? Thank you for your question. I think that's a very important question and only clans and nations can make decisions for themselves. Even to entertain the idea of a treaty, they have to have free, prior and informed consent and self-determine their own destiny. Something that this other uh, alternative does not give you. So a treaty is about peace. It's about us uh, participating in this society in a way where we can prosper, like everybody else seems to do in this country. We're the, you know, the sickest, poorest, dying every day. Mm -hmm. Nothing's going to change by an advisory body. We've told the government that we don't want to cede sovereignty. We've told the government to implement the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, the Bringing Them Home report, which are 30 and 20-year-old reports 
And we see the Closing the Gap <coughs> report every year. Where are they failing? Incarceration and child stealing. They're two reports that e even when Labor in power last time did not implement. So mm. if we need to do anything in this country, it's save our life and implement those recommendations at the next sitting. It's so simple. The, but th there's no yeah. political will from this government to do that. Well, that's wrong. That's wrong. And I'll tell you why it's wrong. Because we know that we've got... Uh, Senator Pat Dodson, who was a Royal Commissioner on mm. the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, and I've never worked with anyone who is more passionate of wanting to ensure that the incarceration rates in this country drop. Uh, there is no mm. doubt that every state and territory jurisdiction has responsibility uh, for the jails and for the, for the custodial <laughs> sentences, and there are many that need to improve their game. There's no doubt about that too. And in terms of sovereignty, well, we have said on numerous occasions, even as recent as the Senate estimates uh, through the Attorney-General's office, uh, that sovereignty in terms of the voice of course First Nations people will not cede sovereignty. I'm a Yanyuagato woman from the Gulf of Carpentaria. We've never ceded sovereignty. And do you think I'd stand by and let that happen? Mm. No way. So, mm. please. Mm. It, let's, no. let, it's a misnomer. Wait, wait. Sovereignty will not be uh, taken yeah. over or lost in this mm. process. Mm. How, how quickly... Uh, because part of the, the process here is this voice treaty truth that treaty should come from voice, mm. how quickly will it move, if there was a successful referendum, to a treaty process? Well, we've certainly made the commitment directly to the Uluru Statement from the heart with voice treaty truth. We want to establish a Makarata Commission, which we know is about when two sides come together Will this together be the sort of treaty war. that Lydia is talking about? Well, in terms of uh, Lydia's thought, thoughts in terms of a treaty, I, I just... And this is where I did want to explore it once we went back to the Senate. But we know that a treaty is underway in different jurisdictions across the country at various levels, OK? Mm. So each state and territory are trying to do their best. We've seen in South Australia that they're already working towards a legislation in terms of a voice and treaty. So we know in the Northern Territory we're trying to do the same. Now, we're all at different uh, levels of that. But whether the federal government can do that sooner, well, that's obviously a debate we still have to have in the Senate. But it does play into whether people are going to vote for the voice or not. And, you know, I'm obviously quite well declared where I'll be voting and what, what our party's decided to Are you also opposed to a treaty as well as my, the voice? My, to answer the question, though, I was speaking to um, locals in the northeast of Victoria, uh, Aboriginal uh, locals about this exact question. They were supportive of the voice until they heard the Prime Minister say it's just an advisory body, it's only got advisory capacity. So you would like it to have more power? I'm telling you what Indigenous Australians that I represent in That's Victoria... That's you're talking to. Yeah, yeah well, Victoria, um, yeah. that I spoke to. I don't presume to speak on behalf of Indigenous Australians, Stan. I wouldn't do that. But what they've told me is that they were going to vote for the voice until Albo said that, and now exactly saying Victoria is well down the path to treaty, mm -hmm. and so they think the voice is something Could more remote they're... communities need and that Victoria is well on the way. Yeah, they're, they're setting up a, a, a treaty mechanism mm. in Victoria, so they've still got to negotiate all the treaties. Um, they've put uh, a list of they, demands in. What, yes, and what they might do, but what we've got to remember is that a treaty is between <laughs> two sovereign parties. And the only real treaty that we've seen in, in Australia at the moment is the Noongar tri native title claim over Perth, where the, the West Australian government and the, the Noongar people um, came to an agreement. Um, there was land swapping, there was, you know, compensation paid. That's what a treaty is about. And at the Commonwealth level, that is going to be extremely hard because we'll have to have 250, 300 individual treaties uh, across the nation. Uh, Lydia, can I just ask you, before we move on to the, the, the next question as well, there will come a time this year, we know that the referendum is on the agenda and we, there's going to be a date set and we're going to go to the, the polls and we're going to have to vote. When you stand there on that day, right now, which way would you vote, yes or no? Well, um, and thank you, Sis, for your explanation on the sovereignty question because I'd really... Uh, like to see that as part of the legislation or even put in the, our constitution that 
uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, first people of this country, are the sovereign people of the lands. That would be amazing if Labor could do that. Um, because in Victoria, when it comes to the treaty negotiations, Labor in Victoria refused to acknowledge that we were the sovereign people of the land. So we can talk about all the deadly treaties around the, the country, but we need national leadership on a treaty. Uh -huh. We need to unite this and can, country. And, and if a voice so, can deliver that, sorry, Lydia, on the day, would, would you, which box would you tick? Right well, now, it depends how many lives we can save between now and then. Mm. Stan, in, in implementing the Royal Commission into mm. Aboriginal deaths in custody, you know, if all the states and territories can agree to a voice, then why can't they agree to raise the age of legal responsibility so we can let our children out of the, these prisons, mm. which you look in the Northern Territory right now, we're full mm. of our children and our people. So, so you're unless to land I see Labor move on those and, and include sovereignty into the Australian constitution that we are sovereign, mm -hmm. or your legislation, then uh, I'm not saying yes. which, where I'm going. I want to see action. So not, yeah. not yes or no words. yet? No, not yet. You I'm not saying which yeah. way I'm going until I see action. I, I, might, I might, before you move on, I might just come back to you, Craig, because you, you have been sitting and like listening to... People are waiting. Yeah. yeah, you have been sitting and listening to a lot of this. I know that you've, you've come to this with an open mind, you want to mm -hmm. explore mm -hmm. the issues, but... You get around and talk to people in your other role with the Republican movement as well. Mm -hmm. What's your mood of the people that you speak to amongst the Australian people? What are you, what are you sensing? Well, what concerns me actually is the media. And uh, I spoke to one of the editors of one of the major mastheads last week and saying that I think where the conversation is going, which is reflected in the questions, is, is concerning because it's much like our recent elections where you know, the misinformation is, is not being challenged by <laughs> the journalists. And so my question is, what is the underlying uh, knowledge base that a journalist should have to be speaking to either the opposition leader or any of the d dissenting voices in this area? And so all of a sudden, the, the narrative can start to be built that there's no detail. And you've just heard here that... Uh, you know, the, the rebuttal to that, but right? But you're not following the yeah. data. and all of a sudden... <laughs> so now Australia's starting to think, I think, improperly. And so my question mm. to everyone I speak to is, well, have you read the co-design report mm. uh, from Calman and Langton? It's 272 pages long. They're not adopting the Calmer langton no. report, though, no. Craig. That's they, my point. No, they said that it sure. formed the foundations, the same as the previous government. The report, the recommendations, would form the foundations of, of moving forward, and that's guiding them. Okay. And that's exactly. what the, so the working group read it, will... Mm. Yeah. That's right. So if journalists haven't well, read that's... it, how can you carry the conversation in a real, authentic way and truthful yeah. way to the Australian people? That, I think, yeah. they, they need, uh, they need that honest. grounding. Yeah. They need at least to have read it. So at least we can have a conversation like here tonight. And we're having these conversations. Mm -hmm. We're hearing these questions. This is part of the, the process. Um, if you're just joining us, you're watching Q&A live with Mullendiri McCarthy, Bridget McKenzie, Tom Calmer, Lydia Thorpe and Craig Foster. And later, we're going to bring you a live performance from acclaimed musician and composer... William Barton. Our next question is a video. It comes from Shirley Campbell mm. in Alice Springs. My name is Shirley Campbell. I co-coordinate the Tungandjera Women's Family Safety Group. I am a third generation town camper. My question to the panel. Yes, I support the voice to parliament, but what's happening recently here in Central Australia, Alice Springs, has raised a big question for me. Just getting more politicians to visit the bush doesn't give us a voice or hear us. But under the voice, what if the decisions that Aboriginal make doesn't fit the government agenda? What then? Mullendary. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, good question. Good question. I mean, a advice, Question. yes, but yeah. how binding will that mm, be? Absolutely. And what if you say no to that advice? Mm. Well, firstly, thank you, Sherlane. Always lovely to hear from you. And um, thinking of you and all the family there. I think what we have to remember here is that when uh, the families or First Nations people gathered at, uh, at Uluru and on Anangu country, that when they came forward with the Uluru statement, it was about an advisory body. And that wasn't the Prime Minister saying that, that was the, the Uluru statement from the heart saying that. And so there will always be an opportunity for people on The Voice to give that advice, frank and fearless. Mm. But it's not about a, a guaranteed position that always that advice will be taken. Just like uh, what this is about is about making sure that whoever's in government never dismantles 
the opportunity for First Nations people to always be a part of policies that are made yeah. about them and for them. So I think we have to remember that uh, it's a structural change that we're focused on first. And of course we're going to learn as we go along, Shirlene, and to everyone else who's wanting to know the question. Of course we're going to learn. There are going to be times where maybe the advice won't be taken. But, but if, hopefully most uh, of the time it will be. If, if you listen to what Shirlene, and Shirlene was, was quite animated about this, mm. that just getting more politicians to visit mm. the bush doesn't give us a voice or hear us. Mm. And what if it doesn't fit a government's agenda, Tom Cullen? Mm. That, mm. that, that, that is the fundamental well, question, isn't it? If, if you can have a body that gives advice, but the advice is overturned, what then? Yeah. Well, it's interesting that, you know, earlier when, when the Uluru uh, statement was presented, there was all these arguments that it was a third chamber and, you know, it was going to have, a, have an authority in the parliament when an uh, advisory body is only a voice and it's a voice to the parliament. So it's not the voice only to the government but to the parliament. So this is where the politicians have got to earn their quid by challenging, um, you know, if, if they don't agree with, with the advice, so be it, but others will agree because it won't be just, you know, advice that's just drawn off the top of the head. Um, it's, it's pretty important advice. And, you know, look, no, no government uh, of any persuasion uh, is immune from receiving reports, their own Senate, House of Rep, Joint Committee reports, that they take no notice of the recommendations. But this is different, sorry, choose. Tom, because this will and be a, a body constituted. It'll be in the Constitution. Uh, yeah. To then say no to the advice from the body that is in the Constitution is different from just any well, other advisory body, isn't it? Well, they're advising Parliament, so, you know, and that's where the politicians, all the politicians, all the parties, have got to start to focus on Indigenous affairs. You know, in 2017, December 2017, the Australian Law Reform Commission um, tabled a report to George Brand... Or he'd, he'd left, but George Brandis had call for the report um, looking at the pathways to justice and it wasn't about doing more consultations it was to look at all the reports including the deaths in custody and this is why I think Lydia this is the one you should be focusing on looking at all of those recommendations what were state responsibilities and what were the Commonwealth responsibilities because the majority of justice issues are state responsibilities state and territory responsibilities not the federal government and so this report which has sat on the shelf uh, Mark Dreyfus has indicated that he's going to start to address it and we'll be keeping the pressure on him to do Bridget, that. Bridget, do you want to say something? Yeah, I did. So, Shirlene is speaking from a lived experience in Alice Springs that has been splashed across all the media outlets um, worth their salt in recent weeks. But this has been a problem in Alice Springs, as Malandiri will know, um, mid last year. And it was well, mm. yes, for decades. And you're in time, but, too. But mm. when the Stronger Futures legislation lapsed, Indigenous community wrote to Linda, made their voice heard within Parliament, yeah. without Parliament, about the impact of the lapsing of that. Yeah. When Tom, when you talk about the tabling of reports to Parliament and whether governments will take notice or not, the Riley report on what to do with, with the lapsing of the Stronger Futures legislation, as would have happened in 2021, was handed yeah. to the Northern Territory Government in 2017. And they didn't put it in place. Mm. They did not put the recommendations that their own report handed down on what mechanisms and support structures do we need other than alcohol bans to assist communities to yeah. overcome intergenerational yeah. trauma and to move forward. So I want to ask you, Malandiri, I mean, this, you were a part of that um, Territory Government before you joined us in the Senate. Why didn't they take up the recommendations of the Riley report handed to Gunner so that what happened in June, end of June last year was in place. They had the time, had they accepted their own recommendations. Well, I wasn't in the no, I know you weren't there then. Uh, government, but I, I have to actually um, put, put, put the onus back on you, Bridget. Um, you were nine years in the cabinet, on and off, and we knew that uh, through the intervention, there was supposed to be an end at the middle of last year. Mm. There was no preparation for an exit strategy of sorts. When you mm. intervene in the lives the of people so dramatically the uh, from the Commonwealth, and yet it wouldn't matter. The fact that the Coalition were in government in the last nine years to be able to have an exit strategy just yeah. to deal with the fact that it was mm. coming out of the Stronger Futures. We, there was none of that. That's, the the that's for why the Gunner government... That's why the Gunner government... keep on using us as a political football. Yeah. You know, they've got to start Agreed. to bite the bullet and address some of it. 100% agree. Just, just 100 on that, just agree. on that, I, I want to... We heard from Shirley. Yeah.
a part of this as well is to hear from First Nations voices and people on the ground who don't get mm. invited to be on mm. panels. I'd like to bring in Paul Towney. Paul, tell us about your experience as a Wiradjuri person in New South Wales, um, Yom Damara. Uh, what your experience is, your lived experience, and what you are looking for in this moment. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, first I'd like to, to um, uh, pay my respects to the Gadigal uh, Nation and mob here in Sydney, on lands I am. And uh, yeah, I'm a proud Radjuri fellow. Mac Holmes, Stan, we grew up together. Cousins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're cousins. <laughs> All mob. Declaration. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we are. <laughs> We've got a lot <laughs> of them. <laughs> right. Look, uh, I'd like for everyone to know here, so me and Stan, and I think most of the, in, the Indigenous mob here, here tonight, um, whether it's my generation or generation before me, my mum and dad, my grandparents, we all come off a mission and reserve. Not wasn't our choice to live on these reserves or be brought up on these reserves. That's what government, that's where they yeah. put us there. Mm -hmm. um, so all the way through, we started with nothing. We've got no economic background, financial background. We don't get, as non-Indigenous Australians do, um, even owning land and ha having to, you know, pass it on to your next generations. There's that wealth ep economic background that non-Indigenous Australians have that we never had. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I speak with all most of the panel here. Lydia, I want to say we're behind you, I'm behind you, my family, mob, especially Radjuri mob. We see what you're trying to do. Um, trying to create, um, keep it up, keep infiltrating. <laughs> um. what's, the, what, what's the question, the one question you have about the voice, Paul, that you... We've got, we've got people here tonight who can answer this. Just hearing, hearing people talk, and it's the same old thing. You know, it's blame on blame, mm. blame on blame. Yeah. To me, Stan, uh, 2023, I'm in the private sector. Um, I'm in the construction industry. I've uh, been struggling for 13 years, trying, trying to get up and get established, but I'm just about, I'm just about ready to chuck it in. Mm. Um, you know, you go out, you get your licences, you get pre qualified and everything, and government certifications and everything, but we don't have that financial background mm. of, of non-Indigenous Australians. And... Everyone thinks if you go into private sector, you've got to have a million dollars in your account to start off. Mm. We don't, but we rely on government support. And in 2023, this month alone, I've been knocked back about five times on government funded construct in construction projects in the billions of dollars, mm. Stan. It's, and it's just, we, what do you do? You just... Mm. Um, so, look, to the panel, Tom, you've been around for years. Uh -huh. And, you know, I'd, I'd read the ABC News this year, Stan. Closing the gap. It's getting worse. It's only met two targets. And that's... I was a young fella in Australia growing up when they kind of... when they bought in Closing the Gap. And, you know, I was kind of, oh, OK, this sounds good. Government's going to actually, you know, work with us or do something for us. But this year, closing the gaps, there's only been two yeah. targets met in, what, 30, 30 years or something, yeah. Tom. Mm. But, you know, and then the other thing for me is national Indigenous unemployment. It's gone up to nearly 20% higher mm. than the national unemployment rate. So, so I suppose it's, it's, there's been a lot of talk and there's been a lot of time, Tom, when you hear from people like Paul and others, why? Why are we not seeing oh, the change? You know, really clearly, when, when um, COAG accepted in December 20, uh, 2007 the Closing the Gap campaign, um, you know, and, and you know, I, I wrote the report, it was on a 25-year strategy, but that was, you know, predicated on there being consistent policy, mm. consistent governments, uh, money based on needs, and etc. 
We've had, I think I counted the other day, eight Prime Ministers in this same period, almost the same number of Ministers for Indigenous Affairs. And, and this is why the voice is so important, because we haven't been party to that. The original set of targets were set by government and, and uh, as, as uh, you know, both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people but also practitioners, we said the targets aren't going to be achieved. And, you know, the, the biggest fault of the governments, um, both, both lots of government, is they keep on wanting to measure success annually. And when you're looking at big population change, it's not going to happen annually, you know. Um, it's, they're long-term gains, uh, long-term strategies, but they are required to have consistent policy approach. And look, you know, I mentioned the number of pollies. You can just imagine, you couldn't imagine, the number of bureaucrats that have mm. changed yeah. and, uh, mm. in the system. And, and just, can yeah. I just say, yeah. we're sick of asking the government. We're sick of standing there like poor people saying, can you give us some money? Yeah. Can you help us? But you know, no, we're sick of it, Tom. A lot we're of people sick aren't, of it. Aren't doing and that. we've got to the point where we're at a climate catastrophe where this country needs Indigenous knowledge and the only uh, meaningful way to get that is through a treaty. Treaty can bring us Senate seats with real power, not advisory. And the last time that something in the Constitution was overturned to benefit the government was a Race Discrimination Act. So how safe is the voice being in the Constitution when, when our uh, racial discrimination laws can be lifted so the government can be racist? Yeah, well, they had to like, reinstate the that, same thing. It on, can on that point, choose to ignore. On that point, we can bring you the, uh, the results of the survey. Paul, thanks for sharing that story. <laughs> I know you've, you've kept your company going for over 10 years now, so, so yeah. hang in there and it's, um, yeah. it's good. Oh, <laughs> We asked you, do you know enough about how an Indigenous voice to Parliament will work to vote in a referendum? Now, we've had over 2,500 responses. Here's what you said, 68% yes, they do know enough about how a voice will work to vote in a referendum. 28% no and 4% unsure. Just a vote. It's just a vote of the audience here Sorry. and people watching the ABC, but that's the result yeah. so far. We're going to hear now from Tom Starrick. Tom? With the passing of our Queen, Elizabeth II, and the recent drama and controversy regarding Harry and Meghan, it seems Australia feels increasingly disconnected from the monarchy. Are the days of Australia's ties to the Crown numbered? I know what your answer to that is, but I'm going to go to you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Yes, you, Craig says. <laughs> But how do we get there, Craig? I know the answer from you is yes, but... The answer for Australia is yes, and it has been for some time. And so, you know, overwhelmingly, the research says that uh, Australians are in favour of decolonisation, really, and this is one part of it. Uh, it's another part of it, right? Decolonisation of thinking um, and moving and walking together. And there's many reasons why Australia want to see that happen. The, the, the issue is the detail and what that model looks like. And but we get to remember that the last because, one, of course, yeah. was the detail. That's detail. right, exactly. Can, can I ask you, and Tom, this might be in your mind as well, but um, what we know we have the, the voice referendum this year. What You're obviously watching that to see how that potentially plays out. For you. What is your timeline? Well, ultimately, it's a timeline of the Albanese government and you're talking about second referendum, uh, second mm. term of government, right? But the issue that we have, you know, with the millions of Australians who want to see that separation and us walking together with First Nations now and creating our own, you know, chapter in our history uh, for a variety of reasons, whether it's because of the hereditary title or it's because of the discriminatory nature of uh, the monarchy or whether it's because of the farce that's currently occurring and, you know, everyone's had a gutful, rightly, or whether it's because of this distance now has become untenable or it's because we're finally going back in time and dealing with these um, foundational questions at the centre of our history. The, the issue, again, say... we'll, we'll come to the detail, won't yeah. I mean, you raised that. Before it was, what model? Is it directly yeah. rep uh, elected? That's right. Is it an, uh, appointed by the parliament? You're still going to have the same issues, aren't you, Craig? Well, yes, and, and consensus needs to be built with Australians around that. Um, the important point is that the support is there. So, yeah. so where do we go from here? So the ARM in recent years, about the last three years, did some significant research. I think it was over 10,000 Australians. And what they said was that they want 
at least some form of direct election, and, and I think rightly so. We want to make sure that someone's in that position who represents us. Currently, there's no accountability. We have no one with the interests of Australia at heart, and I just wonder what, you know, with a symbolic president, if you like, someone who has limited reserve powers, but, but is the people's choice. Some, I wonder, you know, how the conversation would be different in Australia over the last 30, 50, you know, 100 plus years if we had someone there holding the government accountable and asking many of the questions, including about First Nations uh, <laughs> dispossession and disadvantage that we're asking today. Someone to constantly speaking, be speaking for the Australian people. So the model, the Australian Choice model, which I, I would uh, welcome everyone going to the Republic website and reading, <laughs> is about a hybrid model, which is... <laughs> Uh, uh, candidates uh, are put forward by all the state territories and three from the federal government, and then the Australian public having a direct election on those 11 candidates. Can, can I just do a quick straw poll? Hands up if you're in favour of a republic right now. Wow. OK. Mm. And one of the panel as well. Bye. Another one of the panel. Uh, OK, not Bridget. Without, OK, as the token constitutional monarchist... Not, not without a treaty. <laughs> As the, as the constitutional monarchist on the panel, not an absolute monarchist, but a constitutional yeah. monarchist, I think there's something very special about a system of government that keeps politics out of your head of state. Um, I disagree, Craig, well, with a, I think that's a lot idea, of, like, maybe. the assumptions in the commentary around uh, our Governor-General does have Australia's best interest at heart. Well, that's, that's, Actually that's, protects... that's questionable after what happened with Scott well, Morrison recently but... with his secret <laughs> ministry. There are, yeah, so, there are um... numerous... Can I finish? You, you can finish it. So, um, there are numerous examples in our history of Governor-Generals standing up to Prime Ministers of the day. We've got um, Governor-General Casey, for instance, when McMahon wanted to snatch the Prime Ministership after Harold Holt disappeared and McEwen was after it. There's, there's numerous examples throughout our history where Governor-Generals have... You didn't go have... to John Kerr, but... Um... No. <laughs> I, I'm happy to. Um, but there are... Where, where the Governor-General has used those powers to either privately or publicly, hold our PM to account. And that is important. And it, I believe it's important that that person isn't P Donald Trump or Joe Biden. No one's isn't, saying that. No, 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 no. That's, that's a crazy political system. How, how now, much... now, we shouldn't go down that track. Because this is what we see with the it, voice. That's where it this is what go. we see the misinformation. How much we Craig, shouldn't be um... talking about... Everyone needs to be clear that a presidential system in the US is completely different <laughs> to what Australia's ever been talking can about. Can you it's show me no... a president? A I'll, republic I'll show you, I'll show you this... the model. Uh, can you show, show you me a... Rep... Craig, I yep. have a question. Can I... You can. Can I ask my question? Sorry, sorry. Let's let Bridget... I just happen... I would like a repu republic in, on the globe where the presidential election hasn't been political. And whether it's France, whether it's America, wherever I can see, every president elected of a republic has, is a political figure. In that country. Well, I thought that Ireland did a wonderful job, and Mary Robinson, as a symbolic president, but as a, an elder, if you like, of yeah. uh, of Ireland, has become a hugely respected figure and the representative of the people. At the moment, we have no representative in that position, and um, that's what we're seeking: an Australian for Australians How... who can speak on our behalf and hold government accountable. Yeah, Paul. Paul. Uh, Craig, will a republic <coughs> give back? that true sovereignty hmm. of, of Indigenous Australians. Yeah. We're only 3% of the national population of Australia. 97% decide our fate today under government colonial yes. system. Exactly. If, if a treaty can, can assure us hmm. that no matter, you know, numbers-wise, hmm. who votes, hmm. it's taken out of that system that we are at the top of Australia. I, I suppose that, that's, that's something that L Lydia raised before. And, and it does go to the, the, this final question on this before we move on. Mm. How much of what you're seeking to achieve mm. is really linked to what happens this year? Can you imagine a referendum mm. if this one is not necessarily... Successful? Well, you know, that's an imponderable, mm. really. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, they are deeply linked, obviously, because this is about the future of Australia and dealing with the two big questions at the heart of it. The one thing I might say, just in answer to that, is um, that 
you know, as the chair of the Republic movement at the moment only for a few months, the first thing I said is that I'm, I'm very sensitive to the difficult balance to bringing Australia along, mm. educating and having this discussion, while at the same time allowing the space for First Nations leaders, three of whom, you know, we have on the stage, or four, <laughs> four <laughs> of whom we have on the stage here tonight, mm. to have <coughs> that really important conversation. So have, have, have you been distributing Harry's book to sort of spur <laughs> things along? <laughs> Has he been a help? Yeah. <laughs> Stan, I just need yeah. to uh, reiterate that <laughs> we have to settle the country first before we go talking about Republic. Mm. So we need a treaty. That... An advisory body won't do that. If you go to Republic, then out goes everything that yeah. you're voting for this year. If you yes, go for a treaty, good. that lasts... That can last as long as we choose it to last, as long as the other sovereign does the right... Well, the... Uh. The um, yes. Crown, yes. who say that they are the sovereign, as long as they adhere to the laws of the treaty. Yeah. Well, it's no longer reconcilable, as you know, and we agree on this, Lydia, for Australia to walk this path, which we're finally walking, and still have these ties to, you know, 1788. So that has to go. But um, in, in response to your question, what I'd say is the sequencing is important. And so I think this is the right sequencing. We need to go back and deal with the wound at the heart of, you know, the psychology of Australia uh, and the dispossession and the stolen land. All of this thing has to be resolved. Now, whether that's through treaty or through the voice, mm. Um, ultimately, telling. yeah, ultimately that's what we're doing. And then, of course, the next step is for us now to walk together and apart. There is yeah, another yeah. question that relates to this. I want to get a really quick answer from all of you. And the question <laughs> comes from... <laughs> Can we be here all, Good night, we're here all bloody night? Okay. Um, here's from Kane Shasha. Thank you, Stan. Just wanted to ask the panel, what would be your preferred Australia Day? What date? Quickly. Craig. Uh, a different date. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Lydia. You can't change the date of dancing on our graves. You've got to deal with the impact of colonisation and have a treaty. So the day we have a treaty in this country is a day that That's we should celebrate. Tom? Yeah, uh, well, I would go the other and say the day that we have a referee, we become a republic, will be our, our foundational day. Um, far be it from me to change Keating's National Day, but um, I think we voted... The people chose our flag, they chose our um, national anthem. If the people want to change it, let them choose the significant day. Great. Melody. The day we unify our country is the day that we should celebrate who we are as Australians. Here, here. Treaty. Here, here. And we do have a final question. We have a final question. We have time for that. OK. Mark D. Bahadian. Hey guys, my question's for Craig Foster. Have you had any thoughts about getting into politics? Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> He's running you for president. After tonight, <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't even know it was coming. <laughs> That's not one of your cousins. I didn't even well, know it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but after tonight, is politics, you know, you've been listening to it no. in the discussion? No. Oh, look, I have considered it, there's no doubt. I, I don't know what will happen in the future, <laughs> but um, I, I think this is... I was delighted Craig to be asked president. to... <laughs> You know, I think this is one of the big questions with the Republic that goes to the heart of who we are in future. But, but so, it's, so, it's so something important. that's on your mind. And so this is something really passionate. Um, but, but politics that is something that potentially... Well, yeah, it has been, and yes, it is. Um, you know, just trying to make a contribution to the country in some way. But I feel as though this is right at this moment, these two big questions we have to resolve. You've got the three pollies here. Would, would you urge him to do it, Lydia? Uh, um, <laughs> I would say that, you know, you might consider having Nova Paris as your co-chair rather, well, yeah. rather than your junior chair well, you know, in the you name want, of yeah. reconciliation. Well, thank you. You, you understand that uh, I put forward a, a female co-chair on the first day that I walked into the organisation. You're aware of that, right? And so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'm hopeful we have meetings in coming weeks and I'm um, really hopeful that... Well, you may, get, you may get to vote for Craig at some point. Um, <laughs> thank you again for your question. That's we need almost, a black president. That's almost all we have yeah. time for. Um, thanks again to our panel, Malandria McCarthy, Bridget McKenzie, Tom Calmer, Lydia thank Thorpe you. and Craig Foster. Please thank them. OK. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Really thank you. And thank you as well for joining the conversation and streaming us on iView. Next week, uh, I'll be with you live from... This thing keeps popping out of my ear. Um, I'll be <laughs> in Sydney. Among those on the panel, Kurdish Iranian writer and journalist Beruz Bashani. Um, head to our website and you can register right. to yeah. be in the audience mm. for that one. That'll be good. That's now, great. Yeah, it's good. Now for something special, to really special to close the show, a live performance from Queensland's Australian of the Year and renowned Yidaki player, 
William Barton. Here he is with his song, Kakadungu Girdu, about identity <laughs> and the passing of culture from one generation to the next. Thank you, brother. Thank you. 